starting at midnight tonight. Um, from all indications that we've heard and the governor announcing it, um, it does appear that we are um, uh, going to make that, um, that that deadline, so to speak, and uh, move into phase four. But as Tom mentioned, this is not going to be uh, potentially like phase one, two, and three, as in uh, it's not full on essentially with everything else that is not open. Uh, unfortunately, we did uh, receive notification that phase four is, um, you know, being limited uh, to some extent at the moment, at least on the onset. Uh, obviously, we've also heard there's not going to be a phase five per se. It's just that phase four is going to be prolonged and, and kind of stretched out over time. It's just not one of these things where like with phase three, everything listed automatically went with phase three. Um, so obviously we heard that uh, malls and movie theaters and gyms, uh, those type of uh, um, facilities and activities are not opening uh, essentially at 12.01 tonight. Um, uh, they will be opened at some point um, when the, uh, I guess the governor gets on and uh, decides that he has the data and the, um, you know, the, the support uh, from, the, the virus transmission rate, et cetera, um, available to make that decision to open those. So unfortunately we can't, um, you know, be, we are not in a position to be able to open those locally. Um, again, we're following the, uh, you know, the governor's orders and what he's opening and, um, you know, uh, allowing in the different uh, phases and when um, they're able to open. Uh, so we're continuing to monitor that and continuing to, again, advocate locally uh, based on our numbers. Uh, we have many conversations and many uh, different groups uh, working at different levels. Obviously, on the public health side, we you know work through our, our different uh, counterparts throughout the state and within the region, and then obviously work uh, up the chain through the state association and through the Department of Health, uh, Jay and the legislature. Obviously, working through uh, their means through NISAC, through the control room uh, with the elected officials, and again pushing and um, you know trying to find relief and answers. Uh, which have, uh, as we've talked about for the last uh, four weeks plus now, are, are very hard to come by. Uh, we continue to ask questions daily to the uh, control room. Uh, you folks are sending in a lot of great questions. Uh, obviously, we've, we've tried to answer some of them on these different Zoom meetings. Uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously questions offline. We get emailed every day many times by you folks asking questions. And uh, we work really hard to try to get you those answers. So uh, we're going to, again, continue to, um, you know, try to do that as we move into phase four and uh, we try to continue to get slow leaks of information. I will tell you that uh, based on some calls that I've had even uh, as of yesterday with the State Department of Health, this really has not changed with the flow of communication, even in Albany. Uh, they are often not aware um, and or not in tune with uh, some of these changes that are occurring. Uh, they find about them real time, just like we do uh, from the governor, uh, which obviously makes it very challenging for um, us uh, to be able to have the information for you. It makes it challenging for you guys and, and frustrations on uh, you guys trying to, again, be proactive and meeting the intent of the guidelines and having the information you need. Uh, so again, um, we're, we're working hard on this communication flow and this uh, information flow to get it to you guys as, as quickly as we can. But we realize that continues to be a, a point of frustration for you and it's a point of frustration for us. Um, so we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, in this together here, but we are working uh, to get clarifications, et cetera. So uh, with that, um, I'm gonna run through some data like I've done the last few times. Um, again, just to kind of level set and get everybody at the same place with where we're at um, as far as uh, local data and uh, regional data. And then uh, obviously we can talk a little bit about phase four um, and what it looks like right now and what hopefully it may look like. And then obviously there's a lot of late breaking news as of yesterday that I'm sure is on a lot of uh, your, your minds. And again, um, you know, as far as the, the new travel advisory and um, you know, some of these other things that I, I know will probably have some impact on your businesses as far as employees traveling yeah, and yeah, or, yeah. You know, folks coming to our region that may utilize your services. So we can talk about those a little again, late breaking news. We just uh, literally received the uh, advisory guidance uh, like an hour ago. Um, I was in a meeting, so I'm actually just reading it before uh, I got on this call. So, um, uh, but we can talk about that. And again, we'll, we'll be happy to um, share what we do know and uh, we'll continue to, um, you know, push, push information uh, as in real time as we can. So again, let's, uh, I'll share some screens as I'm talking again, uh, just so you guys can see that. And then, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of uh, plug ahead from there. Let me see, we share a screen, start with that one. All right, so uh, this should be a familiar screen to uh, most of you that follow our daily uh, press releases and the briefings that we are having. Um, so this is just our local Genesee Orleans County Health Department data. Um, you know, just running across the lines. Uh, I know we have Genesee and Orleans folks on.
51 for Orleans. Again, 50 of those are in uh, skilled nursing facilities, unfortunately for Orleans, so only one community death. And uh, again, uh, the number we like to talk about a lot is the recovered side, again, uh, 147. And these are folks that would be coming off of mandatory isolation. Uh, once they again meet the state guidelines for clearance, uh, they bump over into the recovered category and 108 for Orleans. Again, we do provide some uh, age breakdown. Again, that's more um, just uh, for our data folks that like to track and uh, see, um, you know, keep track of the demographics on things. Uh, but one thing to note uh, that we tried to draw attention to um, throughout this uh, um, pandemic here is that uh, COVID is impacting all of our different age groups. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk early on about, uh, you know, obviously uh, higher impacts to our, our seniors and our vulnerable populations. And from the severity end, that still remains true. Uh, again, most of our cases uh, where we have hospitalizations and we have, um, you know, obviously negative outcomes with uh, um, uh, deaths, unfortunately, that does still remain to be more in our uh, folks uh, in our, our senior populations or those with immune um, compromised health systems, et cetera. Uh, but again, if you look at the numbers, we do have a lot of folks in 20s, the 30s and the 40s, 50s, et cetera, that have had COVID. Uh, and then obviously the last chart here is just our non-county uh, public health our public regulated facilities. Again, these are overseen by the State Department of Health or the uh, federal government. Um, again, we break those out just to show the difference between community and uh, facility spread. So that's really just a quick snapshot locally of what's going on um, uh, in Genesee and Orleans County specifically. Um, let me jump over here now to uh, regional. Let's see here. So again, the control room is, um, you know, the, the group that uh, continues to monitor, um, this is the right one, continues to monitor uh, all things COVID uh, relative to the Finger Lakes region for us. And this is off the Forward New York website. So obviously this is something that we would encourage you all to visit regularly. Um, this is the one-stop shop for all things COVID uh, relative from the state of New York and uh, regionally. And uh, this is where we go for our information half the time because it usually gets here before uh, sometimes we get the information directly. Uh, but from the, uh, oh, where'd you go? It's disappeared. Must be having some uh, slow IT here at the uh, County Building 2 this morning. Um, all right, so th this information's there again on the, the main page of Forward New York. Uh, you can go down and click on the data. Um, and again, you can look at it from the state as a whole or you can uh, look at it by the different regions. So for right now, and the purpose of this discussion, I'm gonna focus in on the Finger Lakes, which is uh, most important to us locally. Uh, so again, here's our main tracking mechanisms that we're following. So uh, testing, tracing targets, new infections, severity of infection and hospital capacity. These are what the governor has put forward as the metrics to monitor uh, for the region to make sure we're staying within the, the thresholds and, and below the different levels that we need to to remain unpaused and to remain uh, continually moving forward. We've done very well, as you guys are all well aware, since uh, phase one launched. We went right to phase two after two weeks, right to phase three after two weeks, and now uh, ready to move to phase four. Uh, so again, that's uh, hats off to uh, all of you on this call and, and all of our residents and folks who are working hard um, to social distance and um, you know keep, keep their uh, uh, distance from folks and to wear their masks in the community and their businesses. Again, I think that um, it's becoming fairly clear with the data between what we're seeing locally here in uh, New York State versus some of these other states where masking requirements have not been put in place that there is uh, a fairly significant uh, juxtaposition between the two uh, and the amount of inf infection and spread, et cetera, that's going on. Uh, again, we know it's not comfortable. We know it's not what uh, folks really want to be doing, myself included. Uh, but it is uh, what the executive order requires and uh, does appear to be um, uh, being effective in keeping our infection rates lower. Um, so the big ones we're watching, Rob, obviously are the percentage of uh, positive tests. And, um, you know, for the Finger Lakes region, again, we're at 0.9%. Um, Let me see if I can, we can move fast along with the... So again, here's, here's the trends. Um, again, this is all available. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's helpful for folks to see where we've been. And again, this chart here is going back to... You know, Keeps resetting on me. Uh, March 27th. Um, you know, I guess we're going to have to talk to Steve. <laughs> uh, I must have some I, IT, not, not you, Steve, uh, you know, our, our IT Steve uh, guru here over in County Building 2. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing here, see what I can kick out of it. But uh, let's see. Sorry about that, guys. Always uh, technological difficulties when you need it to work. 
Um, so anyways, that, that information's there, but our data is going well. I can show you, maybe this one might be a little easier to show. I've shown this a couple times. Let's see. This is coming out of the, um, the uh, control room. You guys see that? Hopefully that one's coming up. All right, so this is uh, similar to the other one, but it's not uh, off the website, so maybe it's working a little better. Uh, this is our seven-day rolling average for uh, new hospitalizations. Again, you can see the trend line continues to be uh, overall in a positive direction. We seem to be uh, hovering right around that 0.7 right now, uh, but again, down from uh, almost one uh, previous to the start of June. So again, that's doing a, a heading in a positive direction. Hospitalizations, again, another number and metric that we're tracking. Again, the blue line is total hospitalizations. And the uh, kind of the orange uh, line here, bar graph, is the total ICU numbers. And again, this is for the whole region. This isn't just Genesee and Orleans. Uh, but again, you can see we're uh, trending in, in the right direction as far as hospitalization um, admissions. Uh, here is available capacity, uh, which is a very important one. Uh, going back to the beginning of COVID, when there was a lot of concern over bed capacity, um, you know, for folks needing, um, you know, hospitalization and potential ventilators, et cetera. Um, so here you can see that um, uh, things are doing well. Uh, we're, we're holding pretty steady at 52% capacity of ICU beds available in the region and 37% of total beds available in the region. Again, holding very, very steady. That has not changed much since we started tracking uh, when we entered phase one. Uh, this is a key indicator that we want to watch. And, and the governor's metric for this, again, has to be above 30% uh, for both of these. So if we start dipping down in, in available bed capacity for either one of those, uh, that could be a concern. But again, we seem to be doing very well. Uh, new positive seven-day rolling average. Uh, so again, this is um, another metric we're tracking and trending the right direction. So this, uh, again, is, is moving target as we go day by day. But you can see we're down to, to 35. Um, and, and then, um, you know, again, new, new test positives going down, again, rolling in the right direction and our tests uh, per day. Uh, again, a lot of this is driven by the mandatory testing in the nursing homes and skilled, skilled nursing facilities, uh, the amount of them. But again, that continues to go up, but our overall tests uh, continue to go down. So again, regionally, that's just a little bit of a shot, um, you know, a look of where we're at with that. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to continue continue to monitor the uh, COVID um, page on Ford New York and the data metrics. Um, again, uh, as real time as you're going to get um, beyond what we're providing locally. Uh, so continue to monitor that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to jump over to, obviously, is uh, Ford New York, um, the, the main page here, um, as I was just talking about. Let's see if I can try sharing this again. See if it works now. All right. All right. So this is for New York. Uh, we're in the overview of uh, phase four. So this is what really we're talking about today and, and getting into um, and, and what's open. So again, here is what he is listed now: higher education, uh, low risk outdoor arts and entertainment, low risk indoor arts and entertainment, and media production. As we did talk about, uh, obviously, what's been listed there over the last uh, uh, four to six weeks has been, uh, again, malls, movie theaters, gyms, uh, you know, those type of activities. Those have been removed at the moment. Uh, but the expectation, as I mentioned earlier, is those will be added into phase four uh, at some point. Um, we have no uh, good answer to tell you on when that will be. Uh, but they will be added into phase four. Again, there's not at this point going to be any type of phase five, et cetera. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor and push that information as soon as we know. Uh, but this is where it will fall eventually. So if you happen to be one of those businesses on the line right now um, that are looking for that information, this is where it would be um, phase four um, uh, on the Ford New York website. So again, as with the other three phases, uh, each of those sections have uh, information available. So again, higher education, they have the summary guidelines. Uh, the read and affirm and the reopening plan checklist and template that are available. Same thing for low risk outdoor arts and entertainment, um, low risk indoor, and then last uh, media productions. Again, for time's sake, I'm not going to click on and go through all these individually. Again, I'm, I'm trusting that probably a lot of you already have, especially if they happen to be your businesses. Uh, but all the guidelines and the information are there. Um, I'm going to click on one real quick just so you guys can, um, if you haven't had a chance to see it. Uh, this is what you're going to find when you click on it. Uh, up top, you're going to see kind of the general categories, what they're talking about. So, uh, you know, for outdoor, they're including outdoor zoos, botanical gardens, nature parks, grounds or historical sites, cultural institutions, museums, outdoor uh, 
agro-tourism, uh, local agricultural, et cetera. So again, it kind of defines, and again, if you happen to be a niche business that may not fall into these categories, but you think you're low risk, we'd encourage you to go to that lookup tool and I'll show you that in a second. You can put in uh, your information uh, and it will give you some feedback on whether you happen to fit that category and, and whether or not you may be uh, able to open, et cetera. Uh, but what you're gonna see on all of these guidance documents, even from the previous phases is a mandatory and a recommended best practice uh, checklist. So it's very important. We're encouraging folks to really take a look at these thoroughly as you go through. It's gonna give you the, obviously the mandatory piece, which you have to comply with uh, in order to be open that needs to be taken into account in your business plan. And then recommended best practices, not mandatory, but uh, based on, uh, again, what we've, what we've seen and what the recommendations are, we, we'd encourage folks to consider uh, putting these into your plans and in, into what you're doing locally in your business. Um, you know, just real quick, for example, with the low risk, uh, you can see here limit workforce and patron visitor presence to no more than 33%. So there's your first guideline. If you happen to be a, a low risk outdoor um, arts and entertainment venue, uh, you have to be at 33% of capacity. Uh, that includes, you know, obviously the employees and the patrons. Uh, then obviously you can go down through the rest of it and, um, you know, see what uh, additional things may be on. There. So again, that's uh, really what you're going to find in these guidelines. These are really what we're encouraging and you need to follow as, as far as getting into um, your opening plans, et cetera. Um, again, we talked about the safety plan template. This here's just again what it is. That's uh, each, each category has one. It doesn't really change, but allows you to customize and to develop a, a blueprint that's uh, specific for your business. Again, we all know we operate differently. We have different needs for our employees, different ways we interact with our public or our consumers. So customize it, make it whatever you need to, but you have to take into account all the different categories and, and the uh, different information they're asking for within these plans. Um, let's see here. The other, the other thing there was um, the uh, uh, read and reaffirm guidelines. So these are there again too. Uh, for each one of these businesses, you need to go on, uh, read through this uh, this uh, uh, detailed guideline here, and then at the end, there's an opportunity to attest that you've read it. Uh, again, we do receive these lists uh, pretty much on a daily basis from the control room. So we know all the businesses locally that have attested, that have gone on and done that. So it's really a two-part thing. It's attesting, reading the guidelines, and then uh, having your safety plan. Just as a reminder, there is no formal process and need to have that safety plan reviewed and or approved. Um, you have to have it on site and available. Um, if uh, someone happens to be out there or if um, you know, there's an issue at one of these facilities, um, you, know, you potentially maybe ask to produce this document and show that you have a plan in place and how you're meeting the uh, social distancing, the face covering requirements. Um, so again, uh, no, no requirement to have it uh, reviewed and approved, but again, needs to be available. Um, and on site if uh, you know folks are looking for it. Um, let's see here. So again, um, there, there's some the tools there are available for folks. We'd encourage you to go on and uh, utilize them as needed. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Okay. Um, so again, uh, we can talk about a couple other things that changed uh, the other day on the uh, governor's uh, press conference that he had. Um, so faith-based organizations again uh, have been up to 33%. Um, obviously, you know, a couple weeks ago, they were open to 10%, then they went to 25. So now they're at 33. So again, a little more uh, capacity and ability on those uh, faith-based um, uh, uh, organizations to have additional folks um, uh, within the facilities. Uh, the other big thing to note that starts uh, effective uh, midnight when we go into uh, phase four is the so social gathering requirements and limitations have been up to 50. Uh, we know that uh, it's been um, kind of slowly creeping up here. It was, it was a 10, uh, went to 25, and now we're going to be at uh, 50. So again, a little more uh, leeway and flexibility on that. And that's going to really um, uh, be more so on the, on the social side of things, not, not as much in the businesses per se. But again, um, you know, for uh, uh, parties and gatherings and different groups, um, you know, et cetera, that's going to be now at 50. Again, there's, we've been asked several times, when do you think it's going to go up higher than that? We really don't have any uh, good indication on that. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we knew that it was going to be getting up at some point, and we, we hope that it was going to uh, coincide phase four at a minimum, and it did. 
Um, again, I know people would like to see higher than 50, especially those that are having, um, you know, weddings and other parties and gatherings this summer. Uh, but at the moment, that's where we're at. And, um, you know, again, uh, there's really no guidelines or waiver to go outside of that number. Um, so we're just trying to make sure people are aware that that is um, currently where it is uh, set. So the other big thing that uh, just came up, obviously, was the um, travel uh, uh, advisory that just popped up um, yesterday for us. Uh, again, went into effect at midnight. Uh, this is new for all of us. Um, I will tell you that none of us saw this um, coming, <laughs> uh, so to speak. I guess there was probably some maybe indication that it was on the table, I, I suppose. But you know, as far as it being announced, um, that was a surprise to all of us. Um, as much to you guys there um, listening as it was to us within the local health departments and as much as it was to, again, a lot of our State Department of Health folks. Uh, I had a call at noon with uh, State Department of Health and um, they did not have any answers for us. They were um, waiting for the guidelines. So uh, again, just show some of the dysfunction and communication flow here, but we are again trying to uh, uh, really quantify and qualify exactly what the, the restrictions are. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, did, we did just get a guidance document. I'm going to share this. Uh, it is getting put up on our website and uh, it is becoming available. I'm sure it's up on the State Department of Health website also. Uh, but as I mentioned, honestly, I have not necessarily thoroughly vetted through this whole thing. Um, but this is what just came out. Uh, this is the interim guidance uh, for quarantine restrictions on travelers arriving in New York State following out-of-state travel. Uh, so again, what we do know is that there is a lot of increasing uh, transmission occurring around the country right now. Uh, I think there's 27 states that have uh, uh, significantly increasing case numbers. Uh, and the, the ultimate goal here is New York obviously has been decreasing. Um, I just showed you some of the data. And, uh, you know, I think the, the rationale here is we don't want to go the other direction. Um, you know, whether or not uh, there's agreement on uh, advisory of this nature, um, that's not, I guess, here nor there for this discussion. Uh, the reality is uh, he did put this in place. Um, so those are the guidelines um, that, that are coming out. So again, we can, um, you know, maybe I'll get this to you, Tom, if you didn't get the link yet and we can share this. I don't know. I know Jay sent it out earlier. Um, yeah, I think, not, I think yeah, Jay, this, this one was, this one was the latest breaking detail with regard to this I'm surprised that even the control room people, Bob Duffy, Vinny Esposito, Mark Cohn and company in the Finger Lakes region had no idea this was going to show up yesterday. Yeah. And we had our 430 Zoom meeting. Um, and, and so it's everybody is trying to um, figure out, you know, and, and the worst thing any of us can do, and we were reminded again of that again yesterday, don't try to read between the lines and do not try to get ahead of the second floor in the executive office, um, because in that way lies peril. Um, and potential blowback, pushback on on what is going to be a slow and gradual rollout of phase four. Yeah. So um, I see, uh, looks like Heather Kemp put that up there, the, the link to it. So thank you, uh, Heather, for uh, posting that. Um, so that's what I have up on the screen right now. Um, and again, I have not uh, thoroughly delved into all this. So, uh, but what we do know is uh, anybody coming from states with um, you know, transmission of uh, higher than 10 per 100,000 or 10% uh, infection rate um, uh, of a seven day rolling average on testing will fall into this bucket. Uh, right now, um, it, it's uh, obviously, I think seven states at the moment. Nine, uh, let me read them for you, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Washington, state of, uh, thanks to uh, particularly Yakima and Seattle. Um, <laughs> Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, North and South Carolina, Utah, and Texas. Yep. So, and, and that is subject to change. As and is that, that literally can change every day. Yep. I mean, based on one, based one of on those states may drop off, more states may be added on. Uh, again, if you look nationally, there are, like I think I mentioned, at least 27 states with increasing infection rates. So any of those states, if you see spikes, uh, ultimately could meet those thresholds and uh, be put on this list. So the best thing we can do again is encourage folks to monitor that. And then that, again, that tracking system will be up on the state website as far as these states with restrictions. Um, you know, and I know obviously we have our businesses on today. Uh, you folks obviously travel, you have employees that may be traveling, you may be having, uh, you know, folks come in from other states to, um, you know, work with your business, et cetera. Uh, so these are things that you really need to, uh, you know, pay attention to. 
Um, this obviously does not just impact the business side of life. This is for folks uh, that on this call may be going on vacation in a couple of weeks or in a month uh, to one of these locations. Um, so there, there is an impact when you come back or if you happen to be traveling in. What I did notice in here, there is some relief, uh, at least on the business side, that may be helpful um, for uh, you know the folks here. Again, if, if you have people coming in for business that are here for, they, they seem to have different durations of time, uh, you know, 24 hours, uh, 36 hours. Let me see if I scroll down here a little bit. Um, they call them short-term uh, visits, so less than 12 hours. Uh, medium is less than 36, and then longer term, greater than 36 <laughs> hours. And there's different uh, criteria for each one of them, and these are for essential workers. Um, you know, obviously, if you happen to be going on vacation, and, and I know it does touch on this a little bit, and you happen to travel through a state and you stop to get gas or you stop to, to fuel up food-wise, it does not count. Uh, as far as visiting these states, um, again, this is uh, more than you know 24 hours in these locations and, and then coming back. Again, this is new to all of us. Uh, uh, there's really not uh, any indication on uh, really how the enforcement of this is going to work. I mean, the governor made it very clear that there is, uh, you know, some level of. Uh, it's all you, Paul. Well, it's all you. I'm not owning this one. It, <laughs> it's not uh, a matter of owning it. He's already put it out there. Yeah, it's it's going to be uh, challenging. Obviously, you know, there, there's the airlines if people fly in, they can have that. As, as you guys may be aware, even going back to the early COVID days with the travel restrictions from the CDC, we received a, a, a list daily of anybody that traveled back internationally from the hot zones, you know, those level three um, countries. And then we obviously put them under precautionary quarantine and followed them for 14 days. So there is a mechanism for folks traveling back or coming in from the air. Uh, again, that has not been uh, set up or anything that we've seen locally on that. But again, you get into uh, travel in uh, coming from, uh, you know, obviously driving, right? So uh, the, the, the governor's made it clear that it's a, a, a self-quarantine in, in those cases. But uh, if you get caught or if it's made aware that you're not quarantining, uh, then it moves into a mandatory quarantine and or fines, et cetera. How that all works, we don't know. Um, uh, I don't know how you try to track that. Um, you know, the, the reality is there's just a lot of uh, gray area here that um, we're trying to reel with and identify and, and try to come up with some sense of uh, 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 an answer to how this is going to play out. Yes, anyway, Paul, Paul yeah. you didn't get your special magic eight ball this morning from uh, Rush Delivery from Albany that would give you that insight? I did. It said stay home, but I came to work anyways. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't expect to have the answer to this question, but I guess that it does begs a question if uh, like our hoteliers, if uh, somebody shows up in the hotel uh, parking lot with Florida license plates, what are they supposed to do? So the only thing that they say is ask the hotels to communicate the 14 day quarantine to guests who have traveled from one of the impacted states. That mm -hmm. is that there's a sentence in there uh, yeah. again in the press release. As, as Paul's got here, there may be more details in this. Again, we haven't memorized this yet. The other thing that was mentioned in our control room yesterday was the need, um, or at least the inquiry as to how about the other adjoining states, not just Connecticut and New Jersey, but um, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, some of the other New England states that have, that have a lot of interstate uh, travel, um, typically with New York State. Um, are they going to be part of this compact and this sort of Northeast uh, consortium with regard to these travel, um, shall we say, notifications or whatever else. They're talking about common messaging with the three states, but that doesn't go very far when it comes to how do you drill down into these guidances and what the, again, um, he's, he's basically said the state health department is going to be setting up some more of these parameters, but the local health departments are going to be the ones who are, so to speak, going to be drawn into whatever they call enforcement which at this point, um, that none of that is very clear. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it would be actually good for our hoteliers though, if they had to, people had to stay 14 days in their room. So that well, might- <laughs> Well, I mean, well, that gets into some of the nuance of uh, quarantine and that actually is yeah, in yeah. this document. And I know we've talked about it many times during the press briefings, et cetera, but you know, quarantine, you know, when we talk about this officially going into place, I mean, literally if you have people coming to visit or people coming to the state, they're not allowed to leave the the the, the uh, residence or wherever they are. You can't interact with people. You can't go out in the community. You can't visit the venue. You can't go out with family or see. I mean, that's what I mean. There's a lot of restrictions to it that um, I think would um, you know, probably, if anything, 
uh, minimize or reduce people wanting to travel here from those places. Because again, um, if, even if you come here to visit family, you're not going to be able to do that per se uh, in the way you, you'd like to. So, um, and then obviously folks that are New York residents, our county residents that travel, go on vacation to Florida, to Texas, uh, any of these identified states um, that are obviously rolling along here. Um, you know, when you get back, uh, again, there's that now a quarantine phase for you um, essential workers obviously would still be allowed to work just like they have before, uh, as long as you're asymptomatic without any issues. Uh, but again, when you're not at work, you're home. You can't be out in the stores, in the community, and, and those type of things. So it creates a, a lot of um, you know issues potentially for us, and, and a lot of layers and, and a whole tracking uh, kind of nightmare for us in trying to figure this out. Um, and again, this is all very new, um, and uh, hopefully you know review the doc, you know review the guidance. Um, and then obviously we'll, we'll continue to try to fill in the gaps as we get them. Notice also that he set this up as its own separate new nomenclature with a, an executive order 205. So it's not following in the 202 COVID-19 up to number 43 executive order lineage. This has got its own start and its own base for going forward. Again, even in his press release versus his executive order versus today's other Governor Cuomo and the other two states announcements, there's details in little bits and pieces in each one of those information um, for, that came um, out from the state over the last 12 to 18 hours. Um, but again, uh, now that we at least have this this one interim uh, document, that's gonna be the thing that more and more will probably be added onto or supplemented um, by virtue of what the State Department of Health, which again, in the one, uh, the one information release indicated, that's who's kind of driving this aside from the governor himself. Not state, not state ESD, obviously not the liquor authority, um, you know, those kind of things. It's, it literally is the State Department of Health um, and the governor himself once again. So this is all Paul's fault then, right? What's that? This is all Paul's fault then, that's right? Um, but it falls into his lap. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, and, on his, and on his shoulders, um, you know, and the fact that he's, uh, you know, of the uh, the nine Finger Lakes counties, he he kind of runs uh, herd on the health departments for two of them. Doesn't give him an extraordinary vote to talk about you know how you you do something outside <laughs> the parameters, um, because we again are part of a region um, that those metrics that Paul showed you that Joe Stefko updates every day as part of the Finger Lakes region um, is 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 pretty much real time. Um, but again, it's a total region. So even if a particular county is doing you know, better than, so to speak, average. The key is one that the, on the first metric that we're under the one, the, the number one, we're at the 0.9, we're actually the lowest state in the country right now um, with regard to that. That's a good thing from the governor's perspective, um, but now it's what you see as far as what they're seeing in those other states, not just the ones that were named this morning and that already has changed again, um, but in the 23 to 27 others as to what they're seeing and the, and the reemergence um, or the, the, shall we say, super blooming of COVID-19 um, and what this state is trying to avoid and what each region obviously is trying to avoid. Remember, New York City is still in phase two, um, you know, and, and the people to the west of us might get into phase four next Tuesday. Um, so even that's, you know, a, a slight variation and variable based on those dashboards. That dashboard uh, has become pretty much the, uh, the, the holy grail with regard to the state and, and each of our regions. And, and ours has been very both effectively populated and managed. I know Paul's on a regular conference call with Dr. Mendoza and the other health directors in the region, um, which again, gives everybody else, all we amateurs, you know, a real time update, but also another opportunity to ask questions to be funneled up to the state of New York itself. So uh, if, I could, if I could circle back to the, uh... Uh, the business lookup tool we talked about earlier, and we've mentioned that in other uh, Zoom webinars. Now, yep. if you go there and you look up and your business is not listed uh, or it's listed as not being able to open, is there an avenue for businesses to find out if their specific business, can they uh, appeal to the state or to the region? I, the, the, our understand, the region has no, the region is strictly a conduit for information. So you would have to literally um, put a, a query into the state. Um, and, and again, it does not appear that there is a quote unquote, an appeal. Um, what happens is that the regions um, and Finger Lakes is obviously one of the 10 continue to push somewhat detailed questions with regard to, you know, businesses and industries 
you know, as we know, I see Chris is on this call again, you know, with regard to, in our case here, Seabreeze and Darien Lake, you know, where are they in this? They won't say a word about that. Um, you know, despite what I know Chris has put together along with the Six Flags Consortium as far as uh, a very detailed and probably one of the most significant safety plans, um, you know, during this COVID-19 program, um, they are very circumspect and, and obviously the mall owners, they were talking about the Willermite family and others yesterday about basically being quite, they used some four letter Anglo-Saxon words with regard to the attitude of those, those entities and the governor himself. Um, but again, that's not changing anything with regard to level of detail. Like again, from not having a business that, that has a niche code, um, you know, that's what, that's the first thing you try to do. Uh, and then go from there asking um, the state, in that case, ESD, where do we actually fit in? But other than that, the details are, are going to be, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly put out uh, in terms of the movie theaters um, and, and, you know, the, the large venues and things of that nature. Even what you're seeing with regard to the slight movement percentage wise um, or even the 50 going from 25 to 50 people for social gathering there, there, the caution is significant um, and seemingly as far as how the states approach this seems to be justified in terms of that flattened curve. Um, you know, and even somebody asked the other day, when will we start taking the flags from half mass? Um, my sense is it's going to be the, the day after a week or a seven day rolling average when there hasn't been a fatality. Things even like that, that's how the state is thinking through some of this stuff. Right. And did I hear correctly that uh, Darien Lake was open air campgrounds today? Is that today? Campgrounds are open? I don't know Chris if Chris is on pause, but yeah, that, that's our understanding. The campgrounds are opening. Um, and I, I know I did see Chris on the line, but I don't, he's probably. Yes, that is uh, correct. Yeah, yep. I think Just, Justin's on here also. So, so yep. Um, yep. So, a uh, lot, lot, lot of stuff uh, starting to open up, um, you know, obviously in the, the counties, which is a great thing. One thing I did want to, um, you know, highlight again, we've talked about it every time is testing. Um, you know, that's just something I wanted to speak to real quick, and we can get back to some of these questions. Uh, we, we did, uh, you might have saw earlier this week, we started announcing Oak Orchard Community Health uh, in Orleans County particularly has started to uh, open up some community type testing. Uh, this is something that as you all are well aware of, we've been pushing for uh, three to four months now that we do not have any good local community uh, uh, testing sites that are beyond uh, basically a medical visit, an urgent care or a uh, ER visit and or, you know, uh, visiting your primary care physician. So Oak Orchard has, is up in Albion. If the Albion site does have daily testing hours, again, it's appointment based only. So you have to call ahead of time. Uh, but we would encourage folks that uh, need to get tested. Um, uh, you know, if you're an essential worker and you need to get tested um, and or you, uh, you know, obviously have symptoms and you need to get tested, then we'd encourage you to, um, you know, call them up, make an appointment and go up there and get that done. We continue to work on, uh, you know, expanding that potentially here in Genesee County. So we may have some information on that shortly uh, within the next week or so, uh, again, potentially through Oak Orchard. Uh, but we'll let folks know as soon as we have that information. Uh, but in addition to that, obviously, uh, uh, UMMC, uh, Well Now Urgent Care, a lot of the providers, again, you have to be a patient of those providers to get swabbed. Uh, but again, um, you know, some pharmacies, again, regionally are starting to offer uh, swabbing and we continue to work with them with our local pharmacies to try to get some uh, opportunity and capacity. But again, uh, things are moving in the positive direction on that, which is a good thing. Uh, we'll continue to push information on that, but I just wanted to share that Oak Orchard is uh, now a site where you can go get swabbed and that's all they do, they just swab you. You don't have to have a, a, an evaluation or any other type of visit uh, charged to your you know, uh, insurance, et cetera. So that is available now. Yeah, we did have a question on the schools there. I think Jay answered it on the chat, but you might want to elaborate on that. All we hear is that they are, they've been asked to do from, from kindergarten, preschool, all the way up to postdoctoral education at a university and then, or the community college system is that they are all are, have been asked to and developed detailed plans. Those plans have been submitted um, to the state, to, stu to SUNY, for those as far as the public university, uh, SUNY CUNY system. Um, and those are all part of what will be some kind of release we understand, but no details as to do, to what extent, what that means for the fall. Um, you know, those things are not something that, you know, anybody but the, the, uh, the in this case, SUNY 
um, and the individual universities themselves um, are privy to. But there are members of, um, I know on the Finger Lakes board, uh, members of the higher education okay, system uh, in Rochester, uh, U of R, et cetera. Uh, okay, and they obviously are their own best advocates as to what is it going, what does you really need from us? What more can we do? Um, and what can you and we dialogue? And the you and we is the state of New York in Albany and those, uh, those universities and the SUNY system. I know that some of them, I know JT got a letter from UB that they are opening in the fall. So I think it must be individually. With, yeah, it I is. know some of the other colleges like Canisius and have said they are and some haven't said anything yet. So it seems- Well, like there's, there's some difference between obviously the SUNY CUNY system and, and private, right? So I think a lot of the private colleges have come already out and made decisions on how, you know, my, my two children uh, attend Hope College and they've already come out with guidance and already changed it three times since they came out with it. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of variation there. Um, I, I know SUNY um, and CUNY will be coming out uh, with their, yeah. their um, plans. You know, I, I was surprised that you be opened on their own. I thought it'd be a whole statewide you know, system, but uh, they he got the letter from the email. From well, I think there's some local variance between the schools within the guidelines. I know they have to submit their plans and have them approved. Yep. Um, so I think there is some variability there. They must have had their plan approved already. Yeah. And even, even the comment Kelly put up as far as RIT and, and I know one or two others, um, when they get them on campus, they're not going to let them go anywhere and they're going to basically finish as far as Thanksgiving and that will that will be quote unquote first semester. Yeah, um, yeah. a lot so of them are going to do, um, you know, their finals online. So once they go home for Thanksgiving, they don't go back. They do, um, you know, the, the final assessments and everything online. And then that's they'll go back you, again. That's what you're doing. doing. That's what you're but what about like high schools and elementary? Nothing. And they, will that be regional, you think? Or will that be? Well, that, that guidance we're still waiting on, obviously. And I know we have some folks from the school systems on. Um, that, that uh, you know, again, has not come out yet. We, we're hearing that it should be soon. Um, you know, so obviously without that formal guidance, it's hard to plan. I know a lot of schools have been doing, uh, you know, some rough planning with ideas of what they know is going to be at least some, some of the stuff included. Uh, but ultimately that guidance has not come out yet, how they're going to handle all that. Uh, we've been dealing with it ourselves, even with the health department, with uh, uh, special, uh, you know, with transportation for our three to five program. You know, the, the guidelines on transportation and how do you bus kids and, and safely, you know, with social distancing, et cetera, trying to take into account. So there's still a lot of uh, guidance we're waiting on um, that I think will help inform how it all looks in the fall. Paul, can you enlighten a little bit? There's a question here with regard to uh, who pays for the testing. We know that the three regionals that were set up in uh, Monroe County, Erie County, and Niagara County, those are basically free tests because they were set up by the state itself. The yep. Oak Orchard one is not that way, even though they receive some funding, they are not one of those separately approved state uh, operations. Yeah, they are not a uh, state-sponsored one. They did obviously receive some grant funds. Uh, right. from the, they are a federally qualified health center, so they got uh, some grant funds to do testing. Uh, they are going to bill insurance, um, but they also obviously have some level of a charity care and through this grant funds that if, uh, you know, there are folks that um, need to be uh, swabbed and, and don't have insurance, et cetera, you know, they would work with you to uh, accomplish that with a sliding fee, whatever it may be. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the, the only free sites that again are available, sponsored by the state are uh, not unfortunately in Genesee or Orleans or Wyoming or Livingston, any of the rural counties, they all happen to be in Rochester, Buffalo or Niagara Falls. Uh, and so again, those by are appointment, options. right? Yep, they're by appointment. You have to go on, make an appointment, et cetera. Uh, but they are free. You just show up uh, with your appointment time. They swab you and you leave. They don't bill your insurance or anything. Uh, so, again, that is an option for folks. But, again, uh, you, you got to travel to get to them, unfortunately. Um, you know, obviously, within the health department, uh, we have not um, um, done any community swabbing. That is potentially on the table. Again, if we have the supplies and the capacity to do that. Uh, at the moment, um, we, we don't have the supplies anyway. So we continue to push for more uh, test kits, et cetera. Uh, but again, that may be something that we would announce that ahead of time if we are going to do some uh, swabbing at the through the health department. Again, if we did it that way, that would be free. Again, to residents, we would more than likely again collect insurance information and try to bill. But if, if folks didn't have it, it would be free. Okay. Yep. You know, I, I haven't seen any other questions we haven't addressed here. Uh, if anybody has anything to shoot them up there, but. Uh, you know, with this being uh, the start of phase four and there is not really going to be a phase five, what is the best way for all of our people that are still waiting to see what to, what's the best way to keep in touch with is and find out information on what's opening and what's not opening? Well, I mean, I, I would again push everybody forward to New York. Um, that's going to be your best uh, spot for that. You know, we continue to do our uh, Monday through Friday daily uh, press pushes. 
Uh, you know, we do put information on there of the new guidance that's put out uh, every day when it comes, um, at least for the first day or two. Uh, so I would encourage folks to follow that. I know our local uh, media folks and several of them are on this call. Uh, they push that information on every day as far as the links, et cetera. Uh, so that's a great way to um, get that information again for New York. Um, and, and be honest with you, you know, these, uh, the, the press releases that come out even regionally, um, they usually have that information up quicker than uh, most of us even find out about it. Uh, yeah. Tom, the stuff that we send you, which we're getting from the executive office in many cases, you're able to basically just forward that so that the, the actual links are live there and then people can go from there even, right? As far as how you're, you know, so like to your membership, you know, same with GCDC um, and others, uh, you know, that, that seems for us also to be a way to get, we're never going to be out in front of this thing. Yeah. Um, that is certainly, that is the caution we have been told repeatedly. Um, you know, even even the way yesterday was was rolled out, um, even caught the you know their internal people by surprise. And I sense is it's going to continue to be that way. And and the thing that they keep reminding us is that phase four uh, is going to be slow and gradual. Um, and don't be expecting anything to be in a methodical like the two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You know, um, as far as even some of the individual activity areas like a YMCA. Um, or the malls, uh, again, because they're literally trying to, uh, in some cases, put, you know, um, some skin on the bones um, with regard to what they know and where they're getting their information. Um, and I sense that's why they're, they're also not trying to get ahead of themselves, even uh, an optimist like Bob Duffy. Um, you can tell he is very, very circumspect about the information um, he's putting out. Um, and, and that's something that, again, we watched in the Finger Lakes control room. Um, as being pretty much the consistent order of the day. Um, and I don't sense that there's any going to be anything different, particularly with the, the, the melange of phase four businesses that could be there sometime between now and maybe safely say, um, you know, October 31st, 2020. Yeah, I'm just picking a date because it's way out in the future. Shouldn't, shouldn't pick a date like that because <laughs> somebody's going to hold you to it. Okay? Uh, well, if, if the media tries, I can plausibly deny that I still won't even be here by then. So that's right. That's, you know, that's a good date to pick. After I will retired. be retired and I can safely say Ryan Quinn and, and Howard and company, whatever I said, doesn't mean diddly squat at that point. <laughs> so we've got a couple questions here with the parks being open and can people use the picnic tables that are in the parks to meet with clients? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, yeah. Again, we have to do the sanitization. Um, we, if you saw the city's press release, that's what they committed to. And we obviously have a county park in the city. Um, and the same thing with regard to the recreation activities. Um, we're gonna we're moving very cautiously in this area because we obviously don't have the staff to literally stand there. As when I went and got a blood test the other day at UMMC, there's a person wandering that lobby, literally cleaning the chairs we were sitting in, the hand rests, the armrests, everything, um, as well as the check-in process. We don't have that kind of staff, and I, I'm pretty sure the city doesn't either, um, to be going and actually cleaning all these surfaces that people could use. So you may find in our, like in our case of our two county parks, that even at the pavilions right out of the gate, um, you may not see the picnic tables down and sitting. Um, mm -hmm. They may be still stacked up and, and somewhat um, you know, not available. Um, but again, we have to start taking reservations at some point, or will be. Uh, but it, again, it's how we can try to follow um, both our own safety plans that we put together, but these guidances as far as how the state's rolled out, you know, what is now considered an, an activity you can engage in in a public gathering area. Okay. And here's a question. With an outdoor event, are numbers to be based on the 33% capacity or the 50 person maximum? Yeah, well, so I'll take a shot at this. Um, so the 33% really is in line with the businesses and organizations. So again, if you are a, uh, a business, an outdoor low risk activity, you know, indoor low risk, that, that number, you know, the faith based organizations, that's based on your capacity. And so whatever, you know, if your, your capacity is 1000, obviously, you can have, you know, 333 people there, right? Um, because you're at 33% of the capacity. Uh, the 50 person maximum is really geared towards, uh, again, more of the uh, uh, private side, so to speak. It's the gathering. So, you know, yeah, like a neighborhood events. thing, you know, yes. something on, on Washington and, and um, you know, Ross Street, uh, the this crime center of uh, the city of Batavia. So where I happen to live. 
um, you know, graduation parties, for example, there's a lot of those coming up. I know that, uh, you know, those would fall potentially under this 50 person maximum. Um, you know, again, uh, maybe even a faith based event like a church picnic that would be at 50 if it's off site and not, you know, at, at the building, so to speak. So, um, you know, really that, that number around 50 is geared towards, uh, again, social gatherings, uh, not necessarily tied to the business. You have to really look within what is the guidance for, you know, the type of business and what, you know, how do you fit into the guidelines that are on Forward New York? Um, so th there's really a separation between the, you know, capacity percentages and this number of 50 at the moment. Uh, can you provide info on what, what is required of employees and guests at businesses in regards to face coverings? Wouldn't that be included on Forward New York? And, and Yes, their... those are in those guidances. They, they, the, the one thing, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty consistently is that in a, the little area where it kind of differentiates slightly is when you're in a restaurant and you can be, at, or in a bar, when you're standing at all times, you, as the patron, have to be wearing face covering. When you go to sit down to consume, if you are sitting, then you can take that off. But the employees at all times are supposed to maintain face coverings. Um, obviously that term is very general because that's how the guidance was originally put out and hasn't really gone in any more detail than that. So, you know, again, that could be a mask. It could be, uh, you know, a, a surgical mask. It might be one of these cloth masks. It could be a face shield that you can, you know, these plastic shields that I've seen that we've had uh, and, and gotten through EMS, um, as well as, you know, if someone wants to go to the extent of getting fit tested, an N95 mask, but the state has not gone into those things unless you're directly involved in healthcare with that kind of, of face covering. But um, the general guidance is out there always have that at this point, face coverings are still to be the order of the day by anybody going into any eligible phased business in any way, shape or form. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Marty McDonald about uh, the next 30 days for churches. I, I think probably you don't. Yeah, yeah. No, Marty, you, know, you just got to keep, Marty, you got to just got to keep praying um, that, <laughs> that, the, that the Uber guy convinces the, 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 the Andrew guy um, that there is, there is something else that they can do um, and look at. And obviously that's a, you know, with, with a state that it is as, as uh, heterogeneous as we are, um, there's a lot of pressure coming from various parts of the state and denominations with regard to what this has been doing to them. Um, and, and, and again, this is one that, again, they're very, very careful um, in terms of what they're allowing, even the fact that they went to a 33%, um, you know, for um, indoor religious gatherings of the capacity of the building, um, you know, is, is, you know, a, a small incremental step. And, and we seem, we keep getting told that's the way it's going to be. The, the bloom is not going to come off the rose all of a sudden. And it's like back to, you know, what these other 23 to 27 states are experiencing. Because, uh, again, with the dislocation in the economy, um, as well as what's going on with all of our workforces, uh, you know, that is what the state is, is laser focused on, um, trying to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Again, as far as COVID-19 is concerned yeah. and pre-vaccination. Yeah, so right now it's 33% for churches, right? 33%. That's what it says. It literally says here from its indoor religious gatherings at 33% of capacity. So I see the Reverend Vern is here. And again, Vern, thanks for last Sunday uh, letting us do the rotary thing. But obviously, just like we, either with the fire code or with the number of, of, of you know, buns on benches, um, you know, there's a, there's a determination there as far as the fire marshals are concerned in code enforcement. So that's probably what you would be utilizing um, in terms of those indoor gatherings, religious indoor gatherings. Okay. There's one in a business with only one or two people in there besides employees and owner and can keep a six feet distance. Paul, <laughs> well, well, you want to take that one? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, again, the, the, the intent is with social distancing, it's the six foot and or masking, right? So, you know, um, it, if, if folks can keep their six foot distance, yeah. uh, you know, it, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those fine lines and we refer you back to the guidance. And, and, you know, again, as we talked about the mandatory side and the best best practice side, I think the best practice side can tell you to have mask on or some type of face shield. Because again, when you're in a business, um, you know, flow context, you know, how do you know if you're six feet? I mean, you're constantly moving around, you're talking to people, you're, um, you know, so I think it's hard to, 
you know, arbitrarily say I'm always at this six foot separation. So I think the best practice side would say, you know, have some type of face covering on. Uh, but in reality, you know, if you go by, again, the definition of close contact and social distancing, it's six foot or uh, a face covering. Uh, but again, it depends on your business. Again, if you happen to be a food service operation, uh, there is no variance or waiver from that. It, the requirement is right, you have to have that, that uh, you know, face covering on. Uh, if you happen to be another type of business, then there is a little more latitude, I think, uh, involved in that. You know, and that's that's those those are the kind of nuances. You know, if you think back to colonial times, the the skirts that the women wore that had the large hoop at the bottom uh, that you would see sort of in Gone with the Wind. Um, I doubt that that keeps a six foot perimeter um, unless two of them are together. And it's even those kind of gatherings of people for weddings and other things that the state has been very very um, um, cautious on putting out too much um, or or so to speak taking the wraps off things um, just based on what the metrics are telling them. Um, and the and the the tracking as far as the the, the dashboards that we're all seeing on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I think it's also important to remember that the, the goal of the masking and social distancing is to protect others. I mean, we've talked about it many many times. You know, so with that goal in mind, you know, protecting your coworkers, protecting your consumers, those that are visiting or utilizing your facility. You know, the masking component is really there to do that, right? So you're you're containing any virus and or other things from uh, you know being put out into the air into the environment um you know in, in addition uh, again the science out there on COVID in general um is, is moving day by day right as far as we know it's droplet based we know that the primary transmission is person to person but we also know it can linger i mean it can stay in the air it can stay on surfaces for various amounts of time and that face covering is what contains it um, so ultimately i think again from the best practice piece regardless if you have that on, you're, you're keeping any virus from leaving your person, so to speak, um, and ultimately protecting yourself or your, you know, your employees and, uh, you know, folks visiting the business. So um, that's probably the best advice we can give on that um, at the moment. All right. We're at about our one hour mark, which I know is we kind of, kind of try to cut things off there um at that point so I, again i want to thank uh, paul i know you guys are busy paul's got to go out to the throughway stops and check license plates to see <laughs> once they're coming in so i you know, love getting back to his job so uh, uh Takes thank you back to his thanks, childhood uh, when he was in the back seat with his parents and they did the license game <laughs> so thank you paul thank you jay for this this has been great and uh we will keep in touch i, I i'm not going to say we'll, we'll try to see what goes on as and uh maybe we'll have another one of these but, hey, hey tom you know and if, if you have questions that come in or folks have uh you know get them to us and we're happy to yep. dialogue and get you answers as best we can i mean obviously yep. we want to be a source of information um so you know make sure if people have continuing questions that come up or you know or you know on the chat box we didn't get to let us know and we'll, yeah. we'll try to get back to them yeah and, and keep going back to that state those state sites as far as new york yeah. forward and the, and the guidance is in each of the phases because they have put I, I i'm pretty sure they've got a lot of that detail there it just it doesn't pop out because if you look at them particularly these in these uh, the reopening guidances you know, there are basically a 13 page document in each case, but there are modifications and changes for each of the categories of business that are, you know, in each of those phases. So it is it's a template, but it ain't totally, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, the same, uh, you know, ad nauseum kind of stuff. They have tried to get in there and put some details in for each of the phases and the business sectors that they're trying to address. Great. And I'll let you know, too, we did record this and we will put it up uh, on the website or we'll make it available uh, probably by this afternoon. Oh, Paul, uh, there goes our plausible deniability. <laughs> we've got it and we've got a recording. So and uh, I know that uh, Howard uh, streamed this. Thank you, Howard, for streaming it on the Batavian today. So uh, I think it's been very successful. We had over 90 people today. So cool. Uh, it was great to, great to have everybody. And I hope they've been informative for everyone. And uh, Thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Have a good day. Everyone be well, be safe. Thank you, thank you, thank you.